morning. So, um, right. So my name is Josh Long. I'm the developer advocate for the uh, uh, open, source, open Source Spring projects at Pivotal, um, and uh, also a long-time contributor to uh, the activity Open Source projects. And with me, I'm very, very, very excited to welcome my friend Yoram. Um, also, you know, not also uh, one of the um, co-founders of the activity project and a uh, a good friend to the uh, Spring community. Yoram, can you say hi? <laughs> hi, everybody. Good morning. Thank you, Josh, for inviting me. It's an honor to be here. Oh, our honor. Thank you for coming. Um, before we get started, uh, if you leave this discussion with more questions than when you entered, please uh, make note of our Twitter coordinates, our emails, etc. cetera. Um, we're always happy to answer questions. We're always happy to take this discussion uh, to carry carry this discussion further online, so please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions or thoughts, feedback, etc. We're always happy to help. Um, okay, so with that, let's take a look at workflow and sort of the basics behind it. I think Yoram will do do that for us. Can you kick us off? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Josh. Um, <clears throat> so, what is Activity? Well, basically, Activity is a platform for executing workflows or business processes. Now. Uh, you will see that I will mix the words workflow and business process all the time. Um, that's because practically for activity, they mean the same. You've got people who like the word workflow because it's less, less heavy than business process. And you've got people who like business process because it's more heavy than workflow. Anyway, I'll use them both um, and they basically mean the same for activity. But let's first take a step back and see what is a business process. Well, basically, if you think about it, every company has at least one, 10, maybe hundreds of business processes everywhere where you combine a certain amount of steps in a certain order or a certain sequence or way of doing things to produce some value. It can be monetary, but it can also be like an internal project. It could be an internal document you want to create. You can help a customer. Then you're talking about the business process. It is what differentiates your company from the other companies who are doing the same. From the activity point of view, basically anywhere where you combine human work with system calls, that's where it gets interested to automate. And that's where a business process management system, a BPM system, like activity comes into play. It's exactly what it does. It executes those processes. It automates them. Now, a business process is kind of funny in the sense that unlike, let's say, something technical like a web container, for example, it is something where everybody is involved. It's not just the IT people um, because the people who are actually executing it, the employees, are just part of it. They're doing it in their day-to-day -day job. You've got the customers. They pay for it. They make you know, the, the, the money roll for the company. And if they weren't there, you wouldn't have business processes. You've got the bosses, the managers, trying to optimize them. They want to squeeze out as much possible effectiveness as they can get out of it. And, of course, you've got us, the developers, implementing those business processes. And often when business processes are discussed, I'm sure you all uh, have seen it and, or, or witnessed it or, or done it yourself, is that you've got a bunch of people standing next to a whiteboard or something, and they're drawing circles and, and, and arrows, and they want to just understand how their company does business, how they do actually do stuff, right? And you, you'll see that it actually is, is, is often used a picture, a diagram. And that's what activity actually does from a very high level point of view. You give it a diagram and it executes that. So why would you actually want to do that? It doesn't sound like appealing. Well, in fact, one of the biggest things uh, about business process management is that by having this diagram, you actually have something really cool, which is improve the communication between technical people and the non-technical people. Um, we've all been in these projects where uh, business gives you a whole bunch of documents, you know, user analysis, requirements gathering, whatever. It's like a big chunk of, of documents. And, and you have to plow through it. And in the end, nobody's happy. IT isn't happy because they, they didn't know what exactly what they were building, and the business isn't happy because IT didn't do what they should be doing, etc. At least with a visualization of your process, you're talking about the same thing. You have a common ground to, to do your communication. The second thing is that a picture says there's more than thousands words, right? So with this picture, with this process, you can really spot complexity really easy. You can see, oh, this, this shouldn't be like it is, right? I mean, this looks way too complex. And you can try to simplify it, try to simplify the way you work. You can see in the picture real quickly if somebody is overloaded, if something is just, yeah, just wrong. Um, and the last thing is that definitely in these times, it is with, with a workflow engine like Activity, it's really cool and really easy to orchestrate distributed services, microservices, uh, services that live on the cloud, services that go on-premise, and just in connect those, orchestrate those straight away and uh, have some, some human tasks in between for, for people coordination. 
Another thing which you get by, by using a system like Activity is that when you run these processes on the Activity engine, you get metrics for free. So the engine keeps all these things, it measures all the things. And one of the things is that if you know what you're doing, if you can measure it, you can optimize it. You can see, oh, this is where, this is where the place is where, where a lot of time is spent or where we lose a lot of time or this guy is, is swamped in work. And you can try to optimize that. You can try to fix that. Without metrics, you can't make really these decisions. So what I'm saying is, is it just a picture and give it to activity? Well, no, that, that would be too simple. It's, it has two sides. So you've got the picture for sure, um, the diagram. But one of the things is that the building blocks of that diagram, they are standardized. So and the, the standard we're using is the, called the BPMN 2.0 standard. It stands for uh, Business Process Model and Notation. We're now at version 2.0. And it basically says, says things like, um, if you've got a regular, uh, re a rectangular uh, shape with a little user icon in the top, that's something for a user, right? If you've got a little circle, it means something happened, an event you didn't anticipate up front. Um, that's one side of the story. The other side of the coin is that the format, which actually is, is, is storing this diagram, right, um, is XML, and it has a lot of, of technical details. So actually, you're feeding in an XML file into Activity, which happened to be uh, visualized as a diagram that, that a lot of people, uh, developers and business people, can read and, and understand. So from a high level, you're giving in this diagram, and, and this is now a very simple diagram, of course, only three steps. Um, you have to imagine that for a real business process, you've got many, many more. I've seen processes with 250 steps going into production. I'm not saying that's a good idea, um, probably not, but at least, you know, it can happen. You, you're giving that diagram, the XML file, into the activity engine, and what you get is then you get a lot of bunch of APIs and they allow you to manage your processes, see the task inboxes for different users, continue processes, get their states. You get some UIs to, to, to work with them. You get insights, you get the metrics, you get reports based on top of that where you can make optimizations and decisions. The activity project itself is fully open source, Apache 2 licensed. It's founded and funded by Fresco uh, more than four years ago now. And it's a very popular project on GitHub. We get a pull request every second day. Uh, and these are really huge pull requests sometimes. It's not like just a typo fix. Sometimes they're really big features, huge refactorings going on. So we've got a very vibrant and, and good community of people. You can also see on the screenshot, we've got uh, yesterday, this is a screenshot I took yesterday, we've got 74 people who have contributed uh, to activity. And, and you have to remember that we're on GitHub only one and a half year. So that's really amazing. Activity is also global. This is uh, from the Google Analytics site uh, for our website downloads. And you can see that basically activity is used all across the world. There are uh, three big, big blocks you can see. You've got, uh, number one, we've got the United States, uh, China, and we've got Central Europe, uh, Germany, uh, uh, most, uh, most blue. Uh, but you can see that we're used all across the globe. And one thing we're very proud of is that activity is very lightweight. Um, it's basically just a matter of adding the Maven dependency to your project, and you've got the jar, and you can start running your processes straight away from Java as you're used to writing code. We designed it to be very light on resources, and I don't know if you can see it, but um, there, I, on my blog, I have a blog post where I, I try to discover how low I could go with the uh, amount of, of memory I gave to the JVM while still executing business processes. So we found that we could go to nine megabytes uh, heap memory, and then you could still execute business processes. So we're very light on, on, on the resources. We also designed it to scale horizontally, so you can set up any number of nodes of activity, and they will just scale uh, because we have a stateless architecture. Of course, uh, there is no silver bullet in, in development. So you still have a single point of failure with the database because every node would go to the database. Uh, but there are solutions, of course, to also uh, fix that. Um, and Activity is not just a hobbyist project on GitHub. We, we are funded and founded by Alfresco. Alfresco also gives commercial support, you know, 24 seven global support, uh, different levels of, of, of uh, SLAs if you want to. We've got a huge partner ecosystem all across the globe. If you've got an activity project, you can just uh, knock on the door of any of these partners and they sure they'll help you. Um, we also got an enterprise offering from Alfresco um, and that's running uh, in, a, in a tryout version on, on SaaS, on the cloud, it's running on Amazon. Uh, it's activity.alfresco.com and I'll show you in a minute. Uh, you can just go there, register for free and start playing around and do the, exactly the same stuff as I will do in the demo in a minute. Or you can, if you want to run it on-premise, we have offerings which exactly, uh, which give you exactly that on-premise. On and that's pretty much my, uh, my jibber-jabber talk I wanted to do, and it's time to go to the code. 
Um, so one of the things about demoing activity and then any business process management uh, example is that it's hard to find a good example because business processes are very company-centric. Of course, if, if your business process would be shared, then your competitors could steal it and they could do the same as you, right? So business processes are very business-specific. So we're going to take the easy route and we're going to do a, a simple photo service where the idea is that a user uploads some photos and then um, some, some other person has to review those photos before they're published to, a, uh, to, to another application. So that's what we're going to do now. We're going to uh, go to Chrome. Uh, here it is. Uh, can I have the Chrome, Josh? Because we're, uh, we're, we're um, doing this in a shared screen thing because I'm, I'm sitting in a hotel room right now. So. Coming right up. Coming. Yep, thank you. I can see it. Brilliant. Thank you very much. So I, like I say, we have an on, online uh, activity.alfresco.com. You can just go there, uh, register yourself. I was already logged in. Uh, we did a session this morning at very early morning. <laughs> and uh, so, so I'm already logged in. So what I'm going to do is, uh, as you logged in, you see your stuff like your task boxes. You can manage your profile. You can see reports. You've got your own little custom applications with your processes. But for this demo, we're going to model the process. And then I'm going to hand it off to Josh, and he's going to show you all the awesome stuff you can do with it with Spring Boot. So I'm going to create a new process. So uh, let's call this one the photo, whoops, photo process. There we go. So what you see here on the left-hand side, this is your palette of, of VPMN constructs. This is your, uh, your canvas where you can draw your process. And these are the properties of every of the steps. Now we've got one, prop, uh, one construct already uh, on the canvas, which is the start event. So this is basically the entry point in your process. Here is where your process is started, it's triggered. Um, and what we're going to do is when the process starts, we're going to do uh, an upload to some service to transform the pictures, the photos I'm going to upload. And then the process is going to wait until that's being done. Now this will be done by some Spring Bean and Josh will go into depth, uh, explain you how this works. But basically it's like a, a push uh, mechanism. I'm going to push it out. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to create what we call an embedded sub-process because I'm, go I'm going to want to uh, a group these things together. And you'll see in a minute why. So first, I'm going to use a service task here. So a service task is a automated system call. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to uh, uh, process the photo. And since we're using Spring, I can just use an expression here. So I can say stuff like, uh, I'm going to assume that this is called photo service dot uh, process photo. And I'm going to hand them off the photo that's being added to the, to the process. And Josh will tell you all about how, how this will work and, and how he will do cool stuff with it after the processing is done. So I'm going to send it outside of the process to some whatever, something externally that's going to process it. And then I need to wait. So in BPMN, that is called a receive task. You're waiting to receive a message from another system. So I'm just going to call this wait for now. Very simple. Um, after the start, you need to add this arrow. It's called a sequence flow in BPMN. And so after the start, you're going to go into this um, uh, embedded sub-process. So we're going to process the photo, we're going to wait, and we're going to do that for every of the pictures of the photos that are being uploaded. So we're going to make this, what they call in BPMN, multi-instance. And we, we want to do it in parallel. There's no reason why we would do it sequentially. We can just fire up everything in parallel. So in parallel, we're going to fire up, we're going to have this for the uh, uh, elements in the, in the photo. So if Josh uploads to me 10 photos, then this will happen exactly 10 times. And I'm going to call the, the element variable that I inject into the context, into the scope of these steps. I'm going to call that photo. Now, the reason why I'm putting this into an embedded sub-process now is because you can do a cool thing here. You can add a boundary event. And you can say, like, if you put it here on the border, you can say that when this fires, like this is the in 10 minutes, this is the uh, ISO 8601 way of saying 10 minutes. You can say, OK, when this fires, I actually want to kill whatever is inside here is still running. So suppose that you've got 10 photos and they haven't been processed yet. This time it will actually kill everything that's inside here and move on. This is a little checkbox here, the cancel activity. And let's just say that this will be like manual processing that will happen. And then we go to the end of the process. This is like the end state of a process, right? So suppose that now we take the happy part, every of the processes of the, of the photos gets um, processed. And then we're going to do a review review of the photos and we need to assign that so where is the assignment here oops sorry oh, yeah here it is 
So I could take any of the system's uh, users, but for now I'm just going to make it really easy for Josh and I'm going to add like a photo reviews group. So this means that there will be a group uh, of people and there will be the name of the group is photo reviewers. And if there's a new task for them, this will be put in the queue of the photo reviews and they can take the task and then uh, complete it and fill in whatever they, they like to do. So uh, after the review photos, I'm going to make a decision and that's done by what they call an exclusive gateway. So I'm going to go either up or down. So um, here, I'm just going to make it really easy. And I'm going to say there's a flow condition here, which is like uh, when this is not approved, you should go up in the process. All we're going to do here is we're going to send an email. Right, there's an email step. And in the email step, I can fill in a lot of email specific stuff, of course. So no reply, that's the from address. I can add some some HTML here. I'm going to make it really easy. Sorry, failure. You can have some imagination here and fill in anything. And the two is whatever. This can be like a variable you get from from the user, um, and I can just fill in whatever I want here now. Right. This then we go to the end. Still get the name. Send failure email, and then we just need to have one other step, which is go to the end of the process. Everything is good. So here we filled in. Uh, if it's not approved, so let's just say this is the one, the default flow. So whenever you, you you couldn't find anything else, just take this route, which is the default flow. And that's pretty much it. So you to save it. Don't worry about the validation errors. Um, I've got some errors here, but it's not important for this demo. But there are some errors, let's say, from, from a pure BPMN modeling perspective. Um, so this is the process as we just modeled it. I can download it. And this is, as I said, this is the XML bit. So you have, there's a lot of XML here, but it doesn't matter because it's, it's, in the end, it's a picture you discuss with your business people and you can, you can use the tooling. Uh, another cool thing is that um, even though this is a web modeling environment, so for business users or even for developers, uh, developers do have the activity Eclipse plugin. So if you're using Eclipse, you can install that plugin and you can connect to uh, this activity.alfresco.com and it actually allows you to push and pull processes from this space. So in this in this case, I could pull it into my Eclipse. I could start adding Java class or Java logic to it, whatever, change it, and push it back again to this environment. And your business people wouldn't need to go into Eclipse or whatever. You can just you can work in the environment you like. And that's probably the the, the point in time where I give it to Josh because he now has the uh, the process and he can now start adding the Spring Boots awesomeness to it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. So that was a uh, that's exactly if you. If you look at that picture, that's a, you're seizing upon the potential here, right? This is a, something that's visually easily digested. It's very, very powerful, um, easy, easy to produce. The tools are of great help if you want to build out the diagram. Uh, but it is worth noting that you could actually write this stuff. Uh, you know, it's not. It doesn't have to be tool generated. It's actually fairly easy to work with uh, XML. Uh, notation. The, the tools just make it dead simple, and they're certainly more appealing. I would I would argue. Um, right. So that's the high level. Let's look. Let's zoom back in down to the code level and look at how we can integrate uh, activity, the workflow engine, this lightweight workflow engine uh, that runs on a Raspberry Pi, for example. And how can we integrate that with our what? Okay. Let's look at how we can integrate that with our um, uh, Spring applications. So. Let's see, where do we keep that slide deck? The uh, the first piece that you have to care about is the process engine itself. This is the centerpiece, the heart of the API. It's sort of like a, the Hibernate session. It's the first thing you're going to deal with when you work with um, activity. It's worth noting that the good Dr. Dave Sire, the uh, co-founder of the Spring Bash project, co you know, co-founder, co-lead of Spring Boot, and uh, co-lead on Spring Cloud and uh, just an all-around groovy guy. Um, uh, he and I are, were the initial sort of uh, contributors to activity from outside of the activity project uh, four years ago. And we actually contributed the original Spring support um, in activity. Now, that, that Spring support still stands, of course. It's still very, very useful. Uh, and that's rooted around this process engine uh, factory bean, right? So this uh, fa this process engine factory bean makes it dead simple to create a process engine, um, and the process engine requires uh, to do its work uh, integration with the Spring expression language, right? Which we make easy. Um, 
uh, it requires uh, awareness of your transactions, right? So if you're using a Spring Platform Transaction Manager, uh, we set that up for you as well. It needs a data source. It needs uh, a fair amount of different pieces, um, and uh, that that all gets set up for you. Doing that, doing that in an automated way, uh, and then layering on top of on top of that functionality um, is what we're going to talk about today, right? Using Spring Boot. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen or played with Spring Boot yet, I, I would humbly refer you to many of the uh, amazing talks that are going to come out of um, the Spring One 2GX videos that were uh, that are slowly trickling online at spring.io for slash videos. I did a talk on just look for, look for the word bootiful, B-O-O-T-I-F-U-L. Uh, but suffice it to say, Spring Boot is a way of automatically configuring things, often just by adding libraries to your class path. So you can layer f functionality. You know, you can assume that there's a common 80% case configuration for various things, including uh, batch processing, web, uh, um, you know, security, uh, integration, big data, etc. All these different libraries that Spring supports, and it, all these different um, innovations, um, Spring Boot provides the 80% configuration case, right? It provides the ability to say, okay, I want something up and running that works in the common cases without any extra code. And then if I want to, if I want to make changes to that code, um, the first thing you might look, reach for is a property file, not Java code, right? So it, we make it dead simple to build up a, a complex working thing uh, automatically, right? So it's not just a matter of having the, the Lego pieces. You don't have to assemble a lot, right? We, did, we now do the assembly for you as, as much as possible. So as part of that, as part of Spring Boot's success, um, Yoram and I tried to, to sort of uh, provide a really, really reasonable uh, Spring Boot activity integration. And so that's what we're going to look at today is, is that integration. This is a early days yet for this, for this activity boot integration. Um, we invite everyone to uh, chime in, follow the code on um, – on GitHub, and you know, if it's uh, something you like, if there's things you want to change or feedback into, uh, let us know. We'll, we'll address it, and hopefully, this will make its way ultimately into the boot project itself. Um, so, and jo Josh, your uh, your microservices with Spring Boot talk is is also live um, oh, right as well. On. If you want to, so that that microservices talk that's not here at Spring.io for such video, is it there, Peter? If it were. That would be uh, it will it it will be it's um, oh, it's just on you it's just on you it's just on YouTube at the moment but it will be in in uh, before this webinar is over. Thank ah. you. <laughs> oh, there it is, microservices webinar building beautiful microservices right on. So uh, do check it out. I mean th that's a, an example of using Spring Boot. Uh, Spring Boot is um, dead simple to get started with, right? So what we envision is you go to this website, start at Spring.io, click on workflow or activity in particular, actually. Uh, click on the checkbox somewhere, and uh, you get a working project. And then that's basically what we have here is an empty project, more or less, right? So I, this this module here is the only thing you should care about. Ignore the rest of this. This is just a, a sub-module, a Git sub-module that points to activity itself because that's where the uh, integration lives. Um, and in boot style, it's as minimalist as we can get it, right? So uh, simple Maven Palm. We use the Spring Boot parent starter um, to uh, provide managed dependency management sections for all the versions and the projects and, and that sort of thing. Um, and then in our code itself, I'm going to go ahead and remove most of this so we can slowly reintroduce them as we, uh, as we work through the example here. So I'll add that, comment all this stuff out except for the basic bits. And what you're left with are um, a graphics library. This is the library that will actually take photos and add the uh, Spring Doge bits, and we'll look at what that is in a minute. Uh, the embedded H2 database, in-memory embedded database, which is great for prototyping and uh, which gets set up for you automatically if you have it on the class path and you have Spring Boot, uh, just as Derby and HSQL will get, automatically get set up if you have those. Uh, Spring Boot starter test support, which brings in everything you could possibly need to do effective unit testing today. Uh, Spring Boot started Timeleaf, which brings in uh, the Timeleaf templating library. Think of Timeleaf as a, as it's sort of like if they took JSP, got rid of all the things that give people hemorrhoids and pain and sadness, and then brought it to 2014. That's kind of an understatement for what Timeleaf is, you know? Um, made it HTML5 friendly, et cetera. A lot of good stuff. 
And then uh, beyond that, we have just these these uh, starters for the activity, boot integration. So org activity, spring boot starter, asterisk, right? Uh, the first one is basic. This just sets up the basic process engine, which is what we talked about earlier. Um, as part of that support, and I'm going to comment all this out now since it's no longer relevant. Um, as part of that support, Spring Boot automatically, uh, and, you know, and the activity integration, automatically picks up processes deploy, based on convention. Of course, it's all overridable, but it'll pick up process definition XML files um, that are deployed in the source main resources processes folder. So here we have our the slightly modified uh, um, BPMN diagram that Yoram just created live for you guys. Uh, that's here. And then we have a demo Java application class, public static void main. And we're going to slowly flesh this out as we introduce these pieces, OK? So first things first, I'm going to go ahead and start up the application. I'm going to use the uh, convenience class here, uh, application.class, args. And then what that's going to give me is a spring application context, which I can then use to get a pointer to the um, process engine, to the activity process engine. There we are. Application context, do that get bean. Process engine. Let's let's just see if that works already. Rather the bat rather the bat. Uh that that line. Uh context. Okay, so now we have that. Put a breakpoint there, debug. So right off the bat, up and running, here we go. And uh, the process engine is non null. It has lots of different objects that you you know you will use at various points in the in the development cycle, uh, including all the Spring process engine configuration and the Spring transaction context factory and all all this sort of stuff that is specific to working with the, with activity in the Spring environment. That's all just sort of taken care of for you. Again, all this is overridable, of course, but it's just nice to know that you know add the right jar. Make sure you have processes in the right directory. And make sure you have a valid data source somewhere, of course. Right? Spring Boot already provides one, but if you were to define your own at bean data source definition, uh, that would be uh, preferred. Right? So you can use this instead of what Spring Boot does, uh, obviously. So already we're making progress. This is a, a you know, we have a we have the ability to call services, to to launch them, to query them, to ask questions, etc. From here, uh, but that's hardly uh, that's hardly worth a webinar, I would think. Um, let's take it a step further. Let's actually build something uh, based around that process. We're going to build a process-driven uh, boot application, right? So um, what kind of process, you might ask? Well, we're going to add the dogeification process. For those of you who don't know, doge is this uh, ridiculously adorable dog meme thingy that uh, uh, I've, you know, I've enjoyed um, demoing. And this is a, no different. The idea is you take a photo. Uh, any old photo, of course, upload it, and uh, add the uh, Spring Doge Spring seal of approval, and you add these ridiculous um, Doge isms like "Wow, very Twitter," you know, such grump, etc. Um, add that to the image, and then voila, you have a Dogeified image, and uh, you can see the results. You know, so what we have is a business process here that um, lets a user upload images, and then another user um, monitor those images. Right and review them. So uh, we'll go ahead and build that out now, uh, piece by piece. Okay, I'll just put that here. First things first, uh, we're going to go ahead and um, restore. I'm, I'm not going to write all this code live, but we'll restore uh, the example. Okay, so first things first, we're going to work with JPA. We're going to work with data. Uh, business process management is all about managing the flow of data between uh, autonomous agents and human beings. Right, human agents in a longer uh, sort of orchestrated picture. So, uh, you know, you want to work with the tools that are familiar with you. To you. So, JPA happens to be a very common choice. So, we're going to bring in the Org Activity Spring Boot Starter JPA support. That will transitively import all of Spring Boot support for JPA, which will make it so that all these annotations resolve, all of the JPA annotations. This is Hibernate, the latest and greatest uh, Hibernate iteration plus JPA, and we have a a simple JPA photo entity here, which has a ID, a uh, user ID, which you can use to correlate with some sort of user, 
uh, and a Boolean, you know, telling you whether the uh, photo has been processed or not. Um, and then a photo repository, and this builds on Spring Data. This is actually a Spring Dataism. This is going to uh, extend the JPA repository, and it's going to provide convenience methods, base methods for things like finding all, uh, querying, flushing, saving, deleting, um, paging, you know, uh, sorting, uh, just basic CRUD, you know, create, read, update, uh, delete style interactions, and uh, that gets synthesized at runtime by Spring. Uh, so you you don't have to write the implementation class. Spring will do that for you, and you can inject that whenever you need to do basic repository style access for any of that for any entity, any photo entity, right? There's similar support for MongoDB and, and Cassandra and Neo4j and Gemfire, of course, but uh, suffice it to say, that's that's uh, a very easy, common one to use. Um, and then with that, we can look at how they actually kick off a, a workflow process that involves JPA data. So uh, again, when you when you start a uh, when you design a workflow process, you can parameterize it just like you would a method or a function in your language of choice, right? Java, Java, Java. Did I hear Java or Groovy or Scala? Or in these guys, um, and so these 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 parameters are called process variables, right? Uh, and they're they're used very much in the same way, right? So you 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 send the process variables into the uh, process as you initialize it, as you launch it. So I'm going to create a, a photo service here that will handle all, all the sort of coarse grain business functionality for our service, and it's in that service that we'll see the large majority of the uh, Activity code. So I'm going to paste this here. Okay. Let the uh, let the P is the import uh, gods here. Do, do, do. Like so. Okay. It's almost done. Everything happy? Okay. So what you have here are um, uh, a it's a basic transactional you know service. It's going to be JPA transactional. As soon as you add the uh, uh, Spring Boot starter JPA support for activity, it brings in the JPA support, sets up JPA, sets up an entity manager factory, connects that entity manager to the data source that you've got in the context, which was set up earlier for you by by Spring Boot. Um, Really, it does a lot for you, right? So, let's see. So, yeah, it, it does a lot for you. That's that's uh, uh, why you don't have to worry about it. So that's that's already there. And then we have a basic service here. Um, it's going to inject a resource, a Spring IO, a Spring Org, uh, Org Spring Framework uh, Core IO uh, resource, which is just an abstraction around, you know, sources of bytes, basically. Um, and we're going to say, give us a resource for this file system path, which we're going to use as a place to upload files throughout this whole journey, right? So it's just going to be a folder on my desktop. Um, we're going to inject the photo repository, the Spring Data photo repository that we saw earlier, and the photo manipulator. This manipulator is a, the graphics client that we have written that's been imported, that's in the Maven Palm. We don't really need to worry about it too much. Suffice it to say, it, it takes a photo in and then dogifies it, adds the actual text and so on. Um, I use this in place of something actually far longer running, but suffice it to say that you could actually have a long running process here. You know, if you had some big data query to run or some analytics to run off of a, off of a, uh, some sort of warehousing uh, machinery, you could do that and hide that as just a step inside this workflow, right? So that's, um, this is our, Long running in terms of transactions uh, service, right? We're gonna actually we want to farm this out, so we'll show we'll show you later how you can actually take long running things and orchestrate them, but not keep them in the same node, right? You can move them out of the processing hot hot path. Uh, other than that, when this service starts up, it sets up it you know confirms that this directory that we want to store uploads actually exists, and if it doesn't exist, it creates the directory um, or at least tries to, and if it doesn't, it you know, raises an exception because it it can't it's not it's not worth trying to continue. It won't work. 
we have basic methods here of supporting uh, writing a photo, you know, writing the bytes for a photo out somewhere, in this case to the upload directory, right, just as we saw above. Um, and another one to read the bytes for a photo that's been written to that directory. Uh, another method to create a photo given a user ID and some bytes for that for that um, image. So this is the public interface. Uh, hopefully, nobody is going to be publicly consuming that directly. So this one just creates a uh, JPA entity. We use a photo repository to save it and give it an ID and all that. And then we write the bytes for that photo uh, out to the file system using the ID of the photo as a file name. So we can easily look it up again later. We have a process instance, we have a, a method that uh, launches the uh, process for us, right? Um, and uh, this launch photo process just takes as its input a uh, collection of photos. These are JPA entities, remember. So you can see we're going to start a process instance by key. It's like calling a function, and we're passing in as the parameters a map, a single value map of, with one key and a collection of photos. Now, it's important to understand that because this is JPA, those photos are uh, not going to be actually stored in the database, in the activity backing databases. Instead, only the primary key will be stored. And then when you use it and evaluate it, it'll be hydrated at runtime. It'll be like it's sort of an in implementation of the uh, claim check pattern here. So normally, when you create a process definition and you pass in variables, normally for primitives, like strings and booleans and dates and whatnot, uh, it does something smart to you know to store those values in a smart way in the backing SQL tables. For anything uh, co more complicated, it actually serializes the Java object. But for JPA, because we've got the Spring Boot um, starter for JPA on the an activity on the class path, this automatically sets up the smart you know the smarts to do the right thing here. So it's so that instead of actually persisting the the two photos that are going to be in this collection. It actually just persists pers the ID. Um, when you take a process definition and you start it, what you, what you get back is a process instance. So a process definition is definitional. It's what you see modeled in that, in that XML diagram, roughly. Uh, and then the process instance is runtime. It's uh, executional. So one is, if you, if you think about it, there's a lot of objects that have to do with the definition, the archetype of the process, right? The Java class, for example, defines the Java method versus the invocation of that method at runtime. That's a different concept. So the process instance is your, is your pointer to the state of that thing as it's running. And you can ask it questions like, how far am I? Where am I? What's my current execution? Et cetera, right? So it can be useful to keep this, keep a, keep this reference handy or uh, at least keep its ID handy, right? So we're going to launch the photo process. That's easy. Um, and then finally, we have the Dogeify photo method. Um, this is the one that actually does the hard work of calling that photo manipulator. Um, and it's going to take as its input a Java 8 Lambda that simply provides an input stream, right? an input stream for the photo. And then it writes the return value, which is an input stream as well. It writes that return value out to the file system, just like we saw earlier you know, for the photo. So it, takes the bytes for the uh, image, reads it in, dogeifies it, and then writes it back out with all the uh, dogeisms attached to it. So again, pretty slick. Uh, you know, you see we've got very little actual service area code related to activity directly here. So that's the first thing. And then uh, we've got even less having to do with the setup and concern of APA and the databases and transactions and all that. It all just works. Um, okay, so that's our basic service. Let's go ahead and bring in our uh, our endpoint, right? So if you build a, a service in the uh, in the woods and there's no HTTP endpoint to call it, did you actually build a service? This is an existential question. Um, we have an answer. You didn't. So we're going to go ahead and uh, expose a little REST service here, a little a HTTP application uh, for our Doge process, right? This web application serves different use cases. It, on, you know, users of one type of role can log in and upload photos. And then users of another type of role can log in and approve the dogeified photos, right? So you've got two different use cases that have to be served here as, as two parts of the, the, the process, right? So go ahead and extract this out. There we are. 
So let's take a let's dissect some of this code. So this is a standard Spring MVC um, web controller, MVC controller, as opposed to a REST controller, but same same idea. Uh, we're going to use the photo repository, the photo service, and the activity task service at various points. The first endpoint that we have to care about is this upload endpoint. We're going to comment out the Spring security principle, right? Because we don't have, uh, we don't want to, let's not worry about Spring security for now. So let's just hard code a username, right? So I'm going to say for JLong. So what's going to happen is somebody's going to call this method. We're going to, yeah, have you noticed that we've got injected here a reference to the multi part HTTP servlet request? You can inject a reference to uh, a multi part file and specify at request body if you like on that, but it only gives you one. I wanted it to, I wanted to be able to obtain multiple multi part file uh, files in the request. So this has seemed like the easiest, most pragmatic way to go. What I'm doing is I'm using Java 8's optional and a, a type, and I'm saying, Check the request and get the multi-file map. The multi-file map contains, as for a key, the name of every form parameter, you know, every multi-part form field, for, for example, a file field, uh, and then it is this value of the data in that multi-part field, right? So if you have um, uh, two, up, two file uploads, you'll have a map of two entries and two values. So what we want to do is say, okay, if this map is not null, then, Let's collect all the values here, right? And the values you get from this map in particular, because it's a multi, in theory, you could have a, a key and then the value with three entries in it, a list. But you get for each value the, it's a list of multi-part files. So I'm just doing some very sort of ugly, um, uh, you know, wrangling. I'm creating an array list and I'm going through each entry in the, uh, in the map which is a collection of multi-part files, and I'm taking all the multi-part files. Uh, that's, that's the, you know, has each, very, has each value, and I'm adding it to this multi-part files holder. So I should have, at the end of this, two photos, for example. Uh, and then for each photo in that multi-part file, um, oops, hello. We still have some blood here. For each um, photo, for each multi-part file in the collection, I'm going through it. I'm going to convert it from a multi-part file into a photo, and I'm going to I do it in this enclosed block here, right? So the conversion basically involves sending that multi-part file, or you know, grabbing the input stream from the multi-part file here, and then passing that into the create photo method on a photo service, and then passing in a, a user ID, and that returns a photo object which then gets added to a collection, which is this thing, which, you know, the stream, that map combination is going to build up for us. Um, and then we call collect. So basically the, the result of all this is to go through every multi-part file and then build a photo for it and then add it to this collection, which we get back. Uh, and then once we have the photos, these JPA photos, that have the, and then we've confirmed that there are bytes in the file system, we actually launch our photo process, right? So we're going to pass in the collection of photos and then get back the process instance, which we then use to dereference the ID, and we store that here and print it out. Um, that's the sort of beginning of the process. Let's go ahead and, you know, we, I know this won't work, but it's good, it's healthy to see this stuff coming together. Ah, so first things first, we need the photo manipulator, remember that's a third party library. That's the uh, Java graphics library for manipulating images that we created. So we're gonna add a bean definition here, define a define it here, okay? So it's Doge photo manipulator and it, there's various, you know, texts that you can add. Uh, these are, it's a triad or trinity. You've got very pivotal, so abstract factory bean, what Java, and these get added, added randomly, right? So you can, You'll see different ones in different places on the image. Run this again. And you don't need the application context anyway. Okay, so that's up and running. Uh, it's not gonna do too terribly much, of course, because, well, it's, it's necessarily uh, not implemented all the way yet. Um, so we're gonna go to localhost, uh, localhost, yeah. 
So we have here uh, nothing. What we want is to actually have an uh, HTML page that shows up, and we have the template here, right? These are dead simple, I mean, no frills, just time leaf HTML templates. I, they could scarcely be called HTML5. They, they are uh, completely unimpressive. Um, it's just a form here with two upload fields um, for the upload page, right? So upload field one, upload field two, and a submit button. It goes to the upload endpoint, which we saw just defined there a minute ago. And then the approve page is just a, uh, you know, it says you approve of these images and it enumerates, it shows all the, it, you know, goes through the collection of dogeified images, writes them out, and then gives you the chance to approve yes or no, right? So this is that conditional flow that we saw earlier. Um, in order for all this stuff to show up, of course, we have to tell Spring MVC that we would like that. So we say, okay, Spring MVC, would you please map map the um, view named upload to the URL called forward slash, right? Um, and then that that's what all we need, right? That'll be the, uh, that's how we're going to map that. So, okay, here we go. Restart. This is a standard Spring MVCism. It's a, we're extending, we're implementing the WebMVC configurer interface. The WebMVC configurer interface has a, uh, a large collection of uh, methods that you can override to call it, to override, you know, um, change the way Spring MVC sets itself up. Uh, if you don't want to have to override all those methods, you can use the no-op abstract WebMVC configurer adapter and all that, you know, that way I can just pick the callback methods I'd like to override here. I'm saying, I want to add a view controller. I want to map this to that view. This view, of course, corresponds to, uh, you know, upload.html. If you had a JSP, you would find that instead, upload.jsp or whatever. Okay, back to this. So there's our, our template. We should now be able to upload a few images, and it happens because, you know, it's Doge that we have some images. So I'm going to go ahead and choose one and then two. And uh, we already know that this will fail. This, this, the next step isn't implemented, right? The, the next step is going to break. So this already, this, this already failed. And, it's, and the reason it failed is because we said, unknown property used in expression, activity delegate. And this refers to the integration with, with Spring Beans and activity that Yoram referred to earlier, right? The uh, uh, BPMN XML notation here has an activity namespace element, activity colon delegate expression equals, quote unquote, you know, this. This is an expression that says, find the spring bean in the context, uh, in the spring context, and then delegate to that. If we just provide a bean reference without any qualification or any expression, uh, and we're using a delegate expression, then the activity is going to look for a bean that has a certain interface. Your arm earlier showed you uh, this example here where you can actually actually call a method directly, for example. And that's, that would be a great demo, but what, what I wanted to show you was that we also have support for tying into Spring integration, right? So Spring integration is a messaging system. It works based on um, uh, the idea that you send and receive messages. It's like if you ever used uh, Spring's JMS message listener container and JMS template, imagine this similar support for AMQP, for Twitter, for email, for file systems, for for uh, Kafka, you know, Apache Kafka, I mean, just anything you'd want to think about in terms of messaging, there's, a, there's an integration. And so as part of our support here for uh, activity, we've developed a Spring Boot or Spring uh, integration for Java configuration uh, style DSL integration for activity. And what this lets you do is it lets you start a workflow process, and then as you, as a workflow process reaches a certain state, for example, this service task, it stops execution of the workflow engine and then sends a message into Spring Integration, right? So from the perspective of Spring Integration, it's like receiving a message from a JMS queue, right? You've just received a notification from the workflow engine saying, it's, it's on you, it's up to you, the ball's in your hand, you know, um, you, do whatever you need to do to satisfy this current state, right? And this current state is, of course, um, where you know this is the uh, the for loop, right? This is for each photo, 
the multi-instance thing, right? So for each photo in that photos array, run this these two uh, these three elements, right? Run the start and then forward to the service task, which is going to forward control out to Spring Integration. And when the reply comes back from Spring Integration, then process will continue uh, on to the next step, right? Which is of course the review stage. So we're going to go ahead and we restore that uh, Spring Integration code. Um, okay. Here we are. So there's a few pieces here. Um, yeah, really? Okay, sure. It's kind of weird that it needs to have a map. Okay. So, good, okay. So um, this is the basic code. This is, there's a few pieces here and it's kind of a, you know, just, uh, it's not too bad once you kind of understand it, but it can be a little uh, confusing for the, very, for the very first time. So what this is, is the bean that we saw referenced, activity delegate, that's what's referenced in the BPMN. That in turn, is going to sit there and re receive all requests from the workflow engine. It's going to receive the execution from the workflow engine, and then it's going to wrap. It's going to pass that on to an object that it keeps inside of it called the activity inbound gateway. The activity inbound gateway is the component that actually talks to Spring Integration, right? So we have this activity behavior is the glue code from activity to Java, and then that glue code passes the baton onto this inbound gateway, which is a glue code from Java Spring Integration. And the uh, Spring Integration, uh, you know, this def the bean for this, this bean is defined right here, right? We've got this activity inbound gateway. And what it's going to do is it's going to take the process engine and various, and various uh, process variables that we expect to have converted back and forth between Spring Integration message headers and uh, process variables. Uh, and then it's going to sit there and forward messages onto any Spring Integration flow that wants to know about it. And we have such a flow right here. We're saying, okay, whenever a message comes in from this inbound gateway, which is to say that a message comes in from the workflow system that has now been paused, um, handle it by calling this, call, this generic callback thing, right? And of course, if you're a Lambda fan as I am, you can easily replace this with something like that. And it becomes very easy to uh, string together very complex flows here. Um, so what I'm saying is, when the message comes in and the message has a payload of type activity execution, which is to say it has the object that's been created for us by activity at that particular state, uh, go ahead and extract from the variables the photo, right? So remember, this is not the photos. This is one photo. It's the, it's the for X part of the for each loop, if you can if you, if you see what I'm saying. So spring integration we'll get three messages for one. If you have three photos, you'll get three messages here. You'll get a, three chances to handle it. Um, so what we're gonna do is get the photo object, again, using that handy dandy JPA integration. We're gonna get the photo ID, uh, print out some information. We're gonna call the photo service and call Dogeify. Uh, and then we're gonna send a message back, a reply message uh, with an extra header saying processed is true, uh, and then passing in the, uh, the execution of the payload. Now, <clears throat> again, there's no reason it had to happen here. I could have, instead, I could have uh, wired this flow up to actually send the message out over RabbitMQ, AMQP, or JMS, or send a tweet, or whatever. You know, I could have written a file. I could have sent the message, message over uh, Kafka or MQTT, and then waited for reply via those channels, right? Uh, that would have been just as natural a thing to do here, but I wanted to demonstrate that you could easily tie in whatever you want, it's just spring innovation. So the sky is the limit, right? And that's the benefit here is that by talking to spring innovation, your workflow system now has uh, tentacles that reach to all parts of your system, all parts of your enterprise. So uh, that's, the, that's a very basic flow. The, res what the response will be that the image has been processed so that the workflow can go ahead and, you know, finish off that one little sub process. It can finish off the execution of that one little four X in photos, right? The X branch, you know, and it'll do this three or two or three times or however many times you have photos. Um, 
So let's go and go ahead and see that work. We have the integration support. Yeah, good. Run, run, run. Okay. There we are. We can see here the activity inbound gateway has been started up. Org Spring Framework Integration Endpoint that had been driven consumer and all the stuff. So the machinery there to listen for and dispatch messages messages is up and running. We I'm gonna go back to the uh upload page. I'm gonna upload some images here and hit submit. And you'll see here on the console uh that Integration, Spring Integration code, this, this code in particular, has received execution ID 16, process instance ID 4, right, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's going to handle photo, JPA photo number one, JPA photo number two. Um, and then this is the code, this is what gets printed out after the process instance has been returned. So, you know, uh, we're already making progress. This is now the actual dogeification process is now done. The next step is for somebody to be able to log in and review the photos, the dogeified photos. So to do that, we have to turn our turn our attention to uh, this idea of users and identities, right? So the the workflow engine, yeah, as you saw Yoram earlier marking up the the BPMN diagram, has a notion of users and groups, and we've adapted uh, that we've adapted that notion, right? This it's powered by something called the identity service inside of Activity. We've adapted it to the Spring Security user detail service contract. So Spring Security, which provides you with uh, login forms and OAuth support and uh, security protection for all manner of you know, sort of uh, hacks and infiltration techniques, all this stuff is, you know, at the heart of all that is this user details um, uh, service interface. And we've provided an implementation of that that talks to this identity service. So you can actually have people log in and log out of your applications and distribute all of tokens and all that based on the uh, users and groups and, and scopes and all that that you've defined it for activity. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and set that up. The This is also very, very easy to do. All you have to do is uncomment um, uh, Spring Boot Starter Security. And uh, we're, we're going to also uncomment the uh, REST API. Well, actually, it's one thing at a time. So we're going to leave, we're going to uncomment Spring Boot Starter Security, which will automatically set up this integration for us. And then we're going to go ahead and add some security um, configuration, right? So Spring, most of Spring security has already been set up for us. All the stuff that Spring Boot could figure out what, for us without actually knowing what we want has already been done. Um, we need some code to actually install the users and groups, right? But um, so what, this is, the, the, what the security configuration is going to do is it's going to say, all requests to forward slash approve have to have the authority, the group called photo reviewers. You saw Yoram putting that in the PPMN diagram earlier, saying that this can only be done by users with this uh, group. Otherwise, it can be done, it can, you know, all other pages, which is to say the forward slash endpoint, can be uh, accessed and used by anybody who's got, who's been authenticated, but it doesn't have to have this particular authority. You can just be a regular user, a photo uploader instead of a photo reviewer, right? Um, and then, of course, we need the actual data. So we'll go ahead and install some seed data here. This is a command line runner. It's a spring boot-ism. All it does is it says, uh, um, you know, when the, app when the container and the application starts up, go ahead and uh, run this callback interface. This is like the initializing bean interface. Run it and pass in the string arguments from public static void main. Makes this an ideal place to build a batch processes or to launch, you know, uh, workflow jobs or whatever. Um, so what we're saying is, okay, install a group called photo reviewers and another group called photo uploaders. And we'll create two users, Yoram and Josh. I will be just a lowly photo uploader. Uh, Yoram will have both uploading and reviewing privileges. So he'll be able to access that second page. And here's just some sort of, these are just convenient little builder methods that I, I wrote uh, to be able to sort of hide the boilerplate here. Um, but notice that all users for now, because it's a simple example, have the password password. Okay. So 
these rules, this data will be used to seed the security, uh, the identity service, this group will be created. And then here in Spring Security, we're saying that this endpoint is only available through the photo reviewers group, which is, which, you know, for anybody who has the same authority, which means in this case that they have this group. So let's go ahead and run this and see what we get. This is going to be using HTTP basic, uh, which is dead simple and requires an absolute minimum of fuss. However, it can be a little annoying to demonstrate on browsers because sometimes they cache your credentials. So, okay. I've tried to access the first page. <clears throat> I'm going to try entering J-L-O-N and then, you know, that, of course, it should fail, right? Not good. J-L-O-N-G, password, should be just fine. I'm allowed to go there, but if I try and go to the approve endpoint, I get, uh, you know, uh, access is denied, arrow 403, forbidden, etc. cetera. Um, so I clearly don't have the requisite scopes. doesn't mean I can't upload some Amazingly cute Doge images, though. So, Doge dot one and Doge two. Hit submit, and you can see the process has been kicked off, um, and the integration code has handled both images. Now I just need somebody to log in and approve them, right? So, I'll as a part of your arm here, or just I'll try to. If the browser will be a little accommodating. No, I need to. Sign out, clear all that, log in again, there's, okay, password again, no thank you, and so now I have the approval page, right, so over here, I've got two images that I want to approve, do I like them? Yeah, of course I do, they're cute, so I'm going to go ahead and say, yeah, approved, good for me, but, um, you know, let's just switch it up a little bit. I'm going to use the Hoff, the amazing Hoff, because he adds good luck to demos. Uh, and I'll go ahead and add uh, another Doge. Hit Submit, and then refresh this one, and you'll see that there's now a Hoff, a Dogeified Hoff, and a Dogeified Doge. But just for demo's sake, because of course this is the pit, the picture of perfection. So, of course, this is just nonsensical. I'm going to say that I don't approve of this. Again, I'm just being crazy here. Just, whoa, you know, that guy. So, uh, hit false. And I, I hit uh, no thanks. And that triggered that uh, email. Remember that um, email that Yoram threatened us with if we didn't approve? So, 9.23 at 11.04. That's right now. And we got this, you know, fairly unimaginative, but it demonstrates the point, email from no reply and activity.com, sorry, it didn't work out, et cetera, right? So that was a, uh, a chaser, it's an escalator, something you can use to rope in human participation. <coughs> so, okay, we've got a lot going here, but again, all this is code, right? And I thought the whole point of business process management was that you should have visibility into the business process as it's being executed by technical components and technical uh, infrastructure. And uh, Spring Boot is all about being um, visible and measurable at production, right, in production. Uh, and that we, Spring Boot provides the actuator framework. The actuator framework here is a, it's a series of components that make it easy to ask questions about the running state of an application, right? So I'm going to go ahead and hit run. And then we've got activities, we've got activity specific support. So I'll go ahead and restart the application after having started that up for you. Okay. Go back to the app here. Good. I'm going to go to metrics. This is just a regular Spring Boot convenience endpoint. It gives you a JSON representation of, you know, how many requests you've got, how much heap you have, how many classes, how much memory, processors, etc. I can go to ENV and get the current environment and my actually running process. This is all the Spring Boot actuator stuff, not even the activity stuff. And just by importing that starter, I've transitively imported the Spring Boot starter stuff, Spring Boot starter actuator bits. Um, so all this is very convenient, right? I can actually do things like beans and, you know, whatever. Uh, but we've now got an activity endpoint, which will tell you how many workflow processes we've got that have been deployed, uh, how many process definitions have, are there in the system. Remember, the database gets reset every time you restart. That's why this is not reflecting anything we've deployed thus far. Um, and even better, 
I can actually, so I'll, you know, before I finish, I'll go ahead and deploy some photos here. Here we go. Submit. Yes. Okay. So now we can see there's five completed activities, one running process instance, which still needs to be, that's why it's still running because it hasn't been, we haven't approved the photos yet, one process definition count, et cetera, one open task, that's the task to review, et cetera. So that's good, but I can also get that convenient, uh, and you can imagine tying this up to, tying this information to a, a BAM, right, business analytics and so on, um, or, just a, or just a router. You know, this might be a check about how, how much more node, how many more nodes you need in the system. Um, there's also a slight convenience endpoint here on the uh, actuator. You can say activity forward slash processes forward slash photo process, and you'll get this, you know, generation, gen auto-generated uh, realization of the uh, BPMN diagram that we saw created earlier. So again, if you if you retain the BPMN geometry in the XML, which is optional, by the way, if you retain it, then this will be laid out and arranged and, and drawn uh, as you do it in your tool. But if you strip that out, you know, the semantics of the shapes are still retained, but the position and the layout relative to each other isn't. So this has to take its best guess. This is why this doesn't look exactly like what Yoram described earlier. That's what I meant when I said it's a slightly tweaked version of the process. So um, with that, I've uh, run out of time and I don't want to keep you too much longer, but it, it's worth remembering that there's a um, REST API here as well. Spring, I mean, sorry, activity ships with a complete REST API. Uh, and it allows you to manage everything, including processes and tasks and so on, all from the REST API. If you use our Spring Boot Starter um, REST API for activity, uh, what you'll get is the REST API stood up. And if you have the security stuff on the class path, it'll automatically override the default security mechanism so that you can use Spring Security to lock down the REST API, uh, which implies that if you wanted to expose the activity REST API to, for example, OAuth, which would make it ideal for consuming from a mobile device or from HTML5 clients or from whatever. Imagine, um, you know, imagine uh, orchestration of a complex, long-running business process across mobile devices and HTML5 pages and browser plugins and desktop apps and web apps and background jobs and so on. Then you can do that, right? That's all. It's all just just add the Spring Boot Starter uh, REST API and the Spring Boot Starter security. Modules and you'll get the support. Um, with that, I would encourage people to check out uh, Spring.io. Obviously, um, uh, we're hoping to have a guide on Spring.io for such guides for activity. Uh, the next steps, of course, for for this support is to develop it into a uh, into what people are hoping they, they that they you know we, we we're very keen on getting feedback. So chime in. We're always happy to have your input. Uh, and eventually we'll hope, we'll hope to see this stuff land inside of the Spring Boot project itself. Um, as always, we are uh, Yoram and Josh. Our emails and Twitter handles and, and GitHub accounts are there. Uh, we're always very happy to carry this discussion uh, onward online. Um, and with that, do we have any questions, Peter? Well, <clears throat> we had a ton of questions, but um, Yoram has just been like killing, killing it while yeah. you're while you've been talking. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean he's he's pretty much uh, handled everything. So, and we are ten minutes over. So I think um, sure. Uh, sure. There's one or two questions that he's just finishing up right now. Um, uh, one of the questions is actually worth you commenting on. So Yoram, maybe you should let Josh handle this one. Uh, it's from Daniel Castillo, and he asks, Are there no docs for like Spring Activity integration? Or a book, um, you know, something something beyond boot. Are there um, no docs I don't know. for well so boot is the new stuff. There is actually documentation for the basic spring activity integration that was originally put put there back in two thousand and ten, right? So that that code is very old and very stable and well documented and well tread. And indeed there are numerous blogs, which by the way you can find uh, as often as not on this week in spring, a blog that we put up on spring that I for slash blog. Uh, every Tuesday, that's me. Uh, I put that together um, every Tuesday. That's today. Uh, but anyway, um, yeah, so there's that documentation. And then the boot stuff is brand new. Or, or, believe me, documentation is something we'll address ASAP. 
Um, but yeah, uh, as the code is still a little fluid, we're, we're not cementing the docs just yet. Yeah, hot off, hot off the press. Got it. Yeah. Okay, very good. Um, so uh, as uh, there's a couple last questions coming in um, I'll, uh, while um, Yoram is knocking those out, maybe yeah. I'll just <clears throat> very quickly mention to everyone that, uh, you know, in case you missed the earlier announcements, this webinar is being recorded. Uh, we will post the recording uh, sometime in the next two weeks uh, to Spring.io forward slash video and um, wrap it with a blog entry at uh, Spring.io forward slash blog. Uh, if you'd like a notice um, about when that replay is available, you can subscribe to the Atom feed for the blog, uh, which is the, the best case because then you get all the great blog content from the Spring Engineering Group, and you'll get notified when all the Spring One replays become public and all that good stuff. Um, or you can be, you know, you can just subscribe to the YouTube channel uh, at uh, spring.io forward slash video. Um, excellent. Um, let's see. So um, looks like there's a couple of other good questions. Um, Hmm, how to integrate activity with Spring Batch. That's an interesting one. Well, there's a couple of channels to do that. If you have particular ideas, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. But uh, Spring Integration can talk. It can be both the client and the producer for you know, uh, messages that eventually launch a batch job, uh, or it can be the, um, the client. Is, rather, Spring Batch can be used to to distribute a batch workload across a cluster. So there's no reason you couldn't, for example, use the support, send a reply, for example, or send a message into Spring Integration from Workflow, and then have that launch a batch job, have the batch job, then you know, spin across a bunch of nodes using what's called distributed chunking or remote chunking, and that's done through Spring Integration. So there is, because batch and integration already have some very well-known integration points, you can take advantage of those with activity. But if you have something in particular, of course, we're always happy to hear that. You know, uh, Please don't hesitate to raise an issue or send an email or tweet or whatever. Yep. Um, I think, uh, I think that, that uh, he, he's actually just knocking out the, the last question here. So, um, wow, yeah. Whoa. <laughs> it's like five pages of screen scroll here. This is pretty good. Nice. Um, well, thank you, everyone, for all the questions and all the interaction. And... Um, you know, let's give a virtual cheer for um, Yoram and, and Josh for doing such an awesome webinar. Thanks, guys. Um, really appreciate it. And uh, if you have um, further questions, um, you can see Yoram and Josh's uh, uh, Twitter handles up there. Um, the best place to post detailed uh, questions, like I have a stack trace, this isn't working, that sort of stuff, yeah, yeah. Um, is on uh, Stack Overflow. Um, and if Definitely. you go to the Spring IO if you go to the Spring IO website, you'll see a right in the header a link called Questions, and that will show you what um, uh, Spring, uh, what um, Stack IO, uh, Stack Overflow tags that we we in fact monitor. monitor. Um, you know, we that uh, our engineering department and you know folks like Josh and and, and yeah, exactly. There it is. Yep. Thanks, Josh. Appreciate the demo. Um, so yeah, there there. That's that's the place to ask more detailed technical questions. If you have a quickie or you have kind of like a high level one, Twitter is always good. Um, and you know, you saw their um, Twitter handles on the previous slide. So great. Right. Um, I think we we seem we're, we're, the question queue seems to be settling down and people are starting to drop off. So. Um, let's let's call it, guys. Thank you so much, and um, uh, please, uh, folks, look forward to Spring IO forward slash blog for announcements about future webinar events, and we hope to see you at the next one. Um, thanks, Joram and Josh, for doing a great job. Thank you for having us, Peter. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Indeed. Thanks, Joram. Thank you. As usual. Bye bye. Take care. Bye -bye. Take care, Joram. Bye bye.